Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. The biggest ever Q&A is today, and it's going to tackle one of the most important issues ever, is how to fix broken bags and get over the so-called sunk cost fallacy, which we've covered before, and a ton more. Um, again, <laughs> you guys are hungry for answers, and I'll try, try my best to provide all the answers I can. And remember, some may get offended by the data, but my role here is to try and help people. And we'll talk about how we do that as well. So a monster pack show, let's go. We'll be talking about fixing your bags, Bitcoin, Bitcoin moving to proof of stake, not going to happen, miners, uh, volume dynamics that's happening out there, how on-chain is different, AI's transformation of everything right now and how it could be or maybe dissimilar to the dot-com bust. Thank you, Doodlebug. Um, Sol versus ETH again. And remember, I own both. And I will ding an asset even if I own it because I don't care. But I believe in being forthright as well. We'll talk about a whole bunch of uh, also wallet security and other investment tips and a whole bunch of charts. So let's go. Thank you all for coming. And of course, none of this is financial advice. And all the questions come from the beautiful team at Patreon. Thank you all for coming every single day. You're amazing. Let's go. Uh, very first question from Everroar. I see a lot of influencers talking about the low volume on Bitcoin. How does the volume relate to the OTC purchases from the ETFs? Great question. Very common question. And we have a model that shows you exactly what's going on. This is called the TABI, the top and bottom indicator. And what I did was I overlaid retail transaction volume over the Bitcoin price. Historically, going back in time, well, going back to 2017, I think. And you can see exactly what the deal is. And you can see, this is, this is so important because I could talk about this chart for maybe 45 minutes. But clearly, retail has not arrived. This was also evident from Okta, where I shared the Coinbase volume as well this week on Tuesday. But the relationship between Bitcoin volume and OTC purchases from ETFs is complicated. So on the one hand, you have the increased demand from Bitcoin from ETF investors. But as a significant portion of all of that ETF-related trading occurs through OTC desks, it's not reflected in volume figures. Now, what is interesting about this chart is look at, let's go back to 2021. We had the April pump, okay? We took us to 67K, and then we tanked down to that 50K, which is coincidentally, no, tanked down to 30K. And then we shot back up to 69K. And what's interesting about this is for the first big pump, retail did not arrive. And much of that was driven by Tesla buying one and a half billion dollars in Bitcoin. And it shows you the impact of just what that was a big purchase back then. But compared to what the ETFs are doing today, that's not a hill of beans. But look at the retail profile on the second pump and look at where we are today. That blue thing ends before I put my red arrow. That's after the fact. That's into the future. Retail is going to come, but they are not here yet. So we have a long way to go. In addition, look how high we are in terms of price compared to where the retail volume is. It's less than half of what it was back in April 2021. So good news is there's a lot of upside left. Retail are not in the building. This is all driven by ETFs right now. And of course, Mr. 100 and a whole bunch of others, Sailor and all the others snacking on Bitcoin. But sometimes retail investors are last. And that's why I'm here to make you first. Because if you're not first, you're last. You become a bag holder. And that's not good. And that'll be a big topic we'll cover today. So if people get, I think the word is butthurt. Sorry about that. But I'm not here to stroke your holdings, whatever you want to say. Next, from Sea Turtle. My husband and I are a young couple and have determined that we are more of the buy and hold type of investors versus the trading in and out type. Our current holdings are 72% Bitcoin, 17% ETH, and 11% Sol. We're considering swapping some of our ETH for Sol since it looks like Sol may run harder in the next year or so. Is this wise or would it be better just to keep our current allocations? So, I will be tackling this in a couple of perspectives because there is a follow-on question, Sea Turtle, related to this. But first, let's look at the chart. We're going to be looking at a lot of charts today because I always say FA first and TA determines your timing. All right, right now we have 
the Denkun release coming in March. That's the new release that'll help Ethereum get a little bit faster and cheaper. In addition, there's a lot of hopes for the ETF for Ethereum to come. So when you look at this chart, okay, it clearly shows, tells you when you need to swap ETH to Sol. That was back in September, October timeframe. And then Solana went on a rampage straight up to 135. Now, uh, as of earlier this year, we saw the flag to swap Sol to ETH. And since then, it's been up and down, but literally this is ETH's time to shine. And per this chart, I would hold out for level three uh, before considering layering back into Solana. So hold for now. The wind is at your back, as they say. And again, I hold Ethereum. I haven't moved the last of my positions yet. And anybody in Patreon will find it as soon as I do. So watch for that. Now, this is related, Sea Turtle. This is from Steve, H1. At the current salt price of 104, do you feel it provides the best risk-adjusted alpha return for this crypto cycle? And would you buy more now? And if not, at what pullback price would you buy? So right now I'm buying at 100 or less. And I did this week as well. So let's look at Sol versus ETH, first of all, because it's kind of related to the previous question. And let's just compare metrics. And I don't need to compare them to all the other chains, but we'll take the biggest and baddest chain, which is Ethereum, the 800 pound gorilla. So just from a quick snippet of our SCP profiler, more on that coming real soon, by the way, you can see that Solana is 1.6 million percent faster. It has 2,600% more daily transactions. It has 70% more daily active users. It does 1,500% the daily transactions over daily active users, yet trades at less than a seventh of the market cap of Ethereum. And if you look at fully diluted market cap, um, and as a percentage of daily transactions, it's 170 times cheaper. And fully diluted market cap from daily active users, it's a thousand percent cheaper. And it also does nearly, it's a less DEX volume, but the DEX volume sometimes surpasses ETH depending on the actual day. But right now it's about half and it's growing very, very fast. So from that perspective, what is the better risk reward? Well, you can do the math, okay? Any of the statistics you look at, any, and I am like a disruption value investor. I find the undervalued asset that has the most, most growth potential. That would be Solana. And there's no other chain like it. In addition, let's look at the Sol upside model. Again, another chart. Here, these are price targets. Super conservative price targets, by the way. This IA Sol upside. Just look up SOL space upside on TradingView. You'll see it. And you can add it to your toolbox for free. But here, we modified it late last year because the community asked us to, because we already hit 20% of ETH. That's the red line down there. Now, since then, ETH has outperformed Solana and actually Bitcoin so far over the last couple of weeks, couple of months, whatever. But if we get back to the place we were in December of 20% of ETH's market cap, that would take the Solana price to 171 bucks from 103 where it is right now. If we go to one third of the market cap of Ethereum, that's $277. If we go to half of Ethereum, that's 421 bucks. And if we go to 70% of Ethereum, 585. A lot of people talk about it becoming parity, but I'm not gonna go there because ETH is still a big machine, a big monster. And remember, we've been at some of these levels before in the past and we can probably go to them again. But the other good news is, as the value of Ethereum rises, Technically, Solana will rise too, but there's a lag in between. Okay, so the future is very bright. And in terms of risk reward, yes, I think it's the safest bet. And that's how I am positioning myself. But remember, I was positioning myself hard <laughs> back when it was like 10 bucks and less. So next question is from EW. And this, this, this question will be, we get this all the time. And I always say, hope is not a strategy. And this is probably the most important question to address this year. All right, let's go. EW. And I'm going to spend some time on this, so be patient. To recuperate losses, I need the following coins to reach these prices. Cardano, $1.10. Audio, $1.15. 
Theta, $7.33. Polkadot, $27.30. I want to rebalance into more Sol and Bitcoin, but want to do it at a time when I can minimize my heavy losses. Are any of those price targets realistic? If so, and I wait for those targets before I rebalance, would I miss the good buying opportunities for Sol and Bitcoin? This is the question that traps so many investors. It's called the sunk cost fallacy. People, if the human nature, they buy something and they lose money on it, and they hold. They hold till they get back to break even. Maybe then they sell or maybe they continue to hold. But this is the trap that people fall into, everybody. And you do not want to do this holding on to an underperforming asset with the hope that it will return to its original break even value is a very common mistake in investing. You are not alone. It is, again, also sometimes called the break even fallacy, but I call it the sunk cost fallacy. And this is a flawed way to think. The way to think every single day is look at your assets and ask yourself, would you buy them now? If the answer is no, get rid of them. It's that simple. It's not hard. But human nature doesn't like to admit a loss or take an L, so they hold on to these things. And that is a problem. Let's look at some numbers. All right, uh, this is from the compendium. Again, sorry, a lot of models today, but all these models are built to address these exact questions. So <laughs> audio and data are basically 80% held by insiders. Uh, you can look at audio. I did some rough ratio calculations for some of these. I didn't spend a lot of time in them because I don't follow these assets very much, but audio has a about a $2,300, $2,400 of market cap per user. That is rich valuation already, okay? And the adoption is flat or down. Also, Theta needs to do an 11x to get back to all-time highs. The question is, will they do that? Let's break down your math of where you need to get back to and then calculate the probability of if you can. So here, you need uh, Cardano to go up 86.44% to get back to your break-even point. Uh, you need Polkadot to go up 252.71%. You need Theta to go up 447.01%. That's probably never going to happen. And Audio, 397, 379%, so nearly 400%. So this is um, a crazy, crazy reach. And again, per what I showed you before, you can almost guarantee... All right, Solana's going to 170, then it's going to 250, then it's probably going to 360 at a minimum. And you can calculate your returns now, like 3.6x for the 360 target. All right, versus these, again, you might be waiting for a long time. Now let's look at, again, I, I promise to spend some time on this because it's so important because many of you are trapped in the same hole. And by the way, you listen to pumpers. If anybody is very pro on these things, I guarantee you it's because either they have a staking pool or they have a huge position, all right? Do your background homework on who pumps these things and make sure that they are objective or not, all right? Because again, you could be trapped in that hole for this whole bull run where life-changing money is going to be made. <sighs> Sorry, this gets me all amped up. So let's talk about this. So far, since 2021, all right, we're going way back in time, way back to the last bull run. All right, Solana's up 170%, Bitcoin's up 32%, Cardano's down 62%, Polkadot's down 64%, Audio's down 76%, and Theta is down 85%. So you can make with that as you will. But we have a product that we built exactly for this reason. I asked the development team back last year, 2022, 2023, we need something to identify if an asset is dead or alive and give users the macro view of where this thing is and how to trade it in and out of cycles. And we made it very, very complicated, so it took nearly a year and a half to make. Uh, but we also had a thing called the zombie coefficient ratio, which is in there to check the liveliness or the zombiness of assets. We decided to do away with that ratio because People found it offensive. But let's go through the ATR model on these assets right now and tell you exactly where you were. So we are, for example, Cardano isn't even at level one. And we are 14 months into a bull market. Not a good sign. 
that would qualify as a zombie in my mind. And a reminder, zombie coefficient is not there anymore, but if you're not at level one into a bull market, you're doing bad. And by the way, that big red shadow at the back, that's called a bear market. So we've got bear markets for stocks and crypto in this actual model as well. So you know kind of where you stand. And the red line is a 200 day moving average and the rest are the six layers. Then we have audio. Audio is not even a quarter way to level one, 14 months into a bull market, all right? You're not getting back to all time highs. Theta, again, theta is not even a third of the way to level one, 14 months into a bull market. Then you have polka dot. Polka dot's not even half the way to level one, 14 months into the bull market, all right? Remember, I did a video two days ago, and rule number two of that video, it was the do's and don'ts for this bull market. Do not invest in old technology. It is critical. And this is the video thumbnail. We'll add a link for it as well. And it has the top five rules, top five things to not do, and the top five things to do. And if you care about being successful, watch that video if you missed it. Now I'm gonna show you a little history chapter two, XRP on the ATR. XRP, again, 14 months into a bull run, not even three quarters of the way to level one and the XRP pumpers are everywhere, okay? This is where we are. Let's look at another one, EOS on ATR. It's not even a quarter way to level one, 14 months into a bull market, okay? So you're getting the picture? This is the zombie coefficient. Now, the good news, after sharing all that bad news, yes, it is possible to recoup your losses, but you gotta, you gotta you bite the bullet. And this is from Altarista, he just joined, Patreon uh, seven weeks ago, and he decided, okay, he listened to us, get rid of the old stuff, Cardano, Polkadot, Cody, Tezos. And I, I pulled this quote in because coincidentally, Altruist, Altruist uh, pinged me yesterday, and I thought it was interesting to watch. And I thought, oh my God, I recognize some of these names, like <laughs> Cardano and Polkadot. So I asked him, could I use this? And he said, sure, I'd love to. And the point is, within seven weeks, he ditched his old stuff and he doubled his portfolio in just seven weeks and he cannot believe it. And he did this by investing in Solana alts. Okay, real simple. You can wait for five years, for eight years, for seven years, for three years for your dead coins to come back. Or you can get rid of them and you can double your money in seven weeks. All right, now, these are some of the things that we've done over the past couple of weeks, December 18th, trade alert on Nosana. It's up nine and a half times, nearly 10X in just eight weeks. And also Fluxbeam up 7.33. It's actually higher than that now because it just took a bump. It's probably nearly 8X now in just a month. So these are things where they're modern, they're new, they've got really good tokenomics and they've got really good adoption and they're in key narratives as well. All right, that's where you need to be. Hope is not a strategy. Clinging onto these old things will kill you. So <laughs> I hope that helps. And sorry for being stern, but literally bite the bullet. Next question from Crypto Whiskey Lover. I love that name. Uh, thoughts on trying to catch more of the crypto AI narrative. I own Nasana, Render, and Tesla, but I feel I'm under allocated in the crypto AI world. Too late to allocate into Fetch AI, Singularity Net, Ocean Protocol, etc. I previously sold out of these as I, as I owned too many coins and uh, to track, but it could be worth reallocating just to have more AI exposure. Pumpamentals seem to be more important than fundamentals in this particular space. This is a super interesting question. There's a lot of stuff in here to unpack. And I like the way you got rid of having too many coins. I'm much more about having less. Okay, less is more. You need to be able to focus on these things. And if you have the ability to pair trade between them after the pumpamentals, that's even better too. So my AI plays, all right? I hold Tesla, but I'm a long-term bag holder. And I've also, I've bought more, I've bought three times the amount of Tesla in the last 12 months, three times than I've had for the past six years or so. And that shows you how bullish I am. And I get more and more bullish every day. They will have their chat GBT moment real soon. I don't know if it's 12 weeks from now or two years from now, but it's guaranteed to happen. And it's going to be very exciting. Then you've got NVIDIA, my other AI play. 
I did sell 80% of it late last year and rotated into CleanSpark and other names, which is good. Um, also, uh, Nosana, I mentioned the 10x in two months. I also have Render, and they are kind of my AI plays. So the other names that you mentioned, they're no good. The Crypto Compendium ruled them out. They have lo lots of weaknesses in one way or another. So I tend to just focus on less. In fact, Nosana has become a very large position in my portfolio, not by choice, but because it's gone up so much over the past two months. And that sometimes happens. But I will let my winners ride and I will layer in at opportunities based on the Lilo model as well. Uh, Render, I have not bought for a quite a long time. I think it's since I, my Should I Buy video last year, um, but I still hold on to that as well. The rest, if I was to buy more, I think uh, Nosana is probably the most undervalued of all of these names. Not financial advice. Uh, next is from Muhammad A. What do you think, where, sorry, where do you think we are in the adaptation of artificial intelligence relative to the adaptation of, of the internet? Late 90s, early 2000s, etc. And also, is it possible to see a crash similar to the dot-com era with many AI company valuations stretched? So I love this one. And uh, it's so interesting because I have lived through both eras and I've been tracking AI and disruption. And I was, you know, spent a lot of time on Sand Hill Road in the late 90s um, during a lot of this crazy time. And I was also probably one of the first people to go short some of these dot-com boom companies. EMC was my first short. And then after that was Cisco, et cetera. And then got back into the market for the new Googles and then the Facebooks, a little bit of Apple, all that type of stuff, Netflix. So it's very, very important to time these things. But there is a massive difference between then and now. Okay, let me talk about that. First of all, it is absolutely fascinating to consider the parallels that are there between the current AI boom and the dot-com bubble. But AI is very different. AI is an industrial revolution like we've never seen on planet Earth in the history of planet Earth. It impacts everything. Think of the dot-com as being selling pet food online and delivering it. The AI revolution impacts everything. It can be integrated into everything. And making a comparison is a challenge, in my opinion. Also, the level of, of uh, you know, power that the AI revolution brings to people and the change it brings to industry is absolutely staggering. It's not like just doing things over the internet, which is a new form of kind of communication and execution. Let's talk about AI for a second. Uh, machine intelligence measured goes back to Alan Turing in 1950. And recently, I'm not somebody who watches movies, but recently I did watch a movie called Ex Machina. You should watch it because it is a brilliant, brilliant movie. And it goes into the Turing test and what AI and AGI is all about is really very special. But there's also a new Turing test today because the world has changed over the last 75 years since Alan Turing was out there. But anyway, the point is, AI has been around. And the question is, can machines think? Can machines think on the par, like you're talking to a human? That was the original Turing test. And now we, we are at the cusp of almost being there too. In fact, some people say Gemini 1.5 is there, but we know how Gemini is quite broke. But anyway, we won't talk about that. Now, in 1956, the term AI was coined at Dartmouth College, where a group of researchers, including John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, and a bunch of others, all names that you probably know, Arthur Samuel, Herbert Simon, Trenchard Moore, Alan Newell, they changed the game, and they believed they could create intelligent machines, and they started doing that as well. So AI, we, we, we have this, what they call a chat GPT moment, but AI has been around for a very long time, but now... The pennies are dropping and things are really kicking into space. So I do believe, short answer to your question, I do believe that the AI revolution, we are still early. It will never end. The leaps and bounds that are coming are going to be absolutely staggering. As Shamath said, the power of AI will be 1600 times more powerful in two to three years than it is today. Okay, I keep using that again and again. Even if he's wrong by many factors, it is still going to be staggering. 
So you need to position yourself for that. It is not a dot-com bust. And if you look at the NVIDIA valuation, I'm working on something on that as well. You can see it is actually fairly valued considering what potential they have. It is not, it is a little bit hot, but I wouldn't call it overpriced compared to Cisco's of 1999-2000. So that's just my two cents. Mohammed, thank you for the question. Next question from Dog1. What are the risks of using JLP as the equivalent of a high-yielding money market account? Not as much upside as other exciting options, but it could be a steady ballast. Modest allocation size, of course. So I love that. Great work on the allocation size. We'll talk a lot about allocation size today as well, because one of the most important things in investing is allocating accordingly. And we'll talk about my AI rules, which I've said since the beginning of when I launched this channel, over three years ago. So first of all, this is the JLP. This is the APY, 143.66% as of 219. By the way, the screenshots from yesterday. But the JLP is overcommitted. The TVL in it is 172 million. They only have room for 170 million. So you can't actually get in right now. So for that, from that perspective, uh, <laughs> wait for it to be open and then allocate according to it. And in full disclosure, I have my money market in there, but not a lot of it, okay? Small allocations. And if you remember this channel and you hear from the beginning, I always, 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 always talk about my risk management 10% rule. And I'll remind everybody again, never lend out more than 10%, never have more than 10% in any wallet or basket, never have more than 10% in Bitcoin miners, never have more than 10% in liquidity pools. By the way, I used to say never have more than 10% in MicroStrategy, but I broke that rule in full disclosure. And that was because I got into options positions that exploded. So they're way more than 10%. But anyway, always allocate carefully. So if it does blow up, you don't get wrecked, okay? Always, since day one, has been my principle. 10% rule, remember everybody. So yes, use it for money market. And with the returns, and the beauty of that one is because you're getting more than 100%, even if it does blow up, say it's got a 10% chance of blowing up, but you're getting more than 100% in a year, it's worth it. It's not picking up pennies in front of a, uh, one of the steamrollers, like the old expression goes. Next question. On to Bitcoin miners, ladies and gentlemen, and I know a lot of you out there have CleanSpark. What is your time horizon for holding CleanSpark? Is it a five to 10 year position or possibly sell when Bitcoin and CleanSpark both look like they're getting toppy? So let, let me show you inside my little head and how I think about the miners. Miners for me are kind of leverage calls on the future of Bitcoin, just like MicroStrategy is. All right. And my minor positions have also become very outsized because of the growth. Now, this is again using the ATR model. And you can see here, this is super interesting. Again, that red shadow on the chart is the bear market. Guess what tanked before the bear market? The miners did. Okay. So important to consider. And look how high we are now compared to the past. It's crazy. But these miners are also very, very different. What's going to happen this time? I don't know. But we, we've got the tools to be able to really tell exactly where they are, where they are going, how high they will go. And if Bitcoin is getting toppy, if the flows stop going into the ETFs, or if they continue for the next eight years like they did with the gold ETF, either way, it's going to be a fun time. It's impossible right now. I would be a fool to predict <laughs> the price um, well, I have, I have some bullish targets and I keep upping my clean spark targets. When we were buying clean spark at two bucks, my bull target was $12, which is kind of embarrassing. And then I went to 18 and then I went to 30 and et cetera. But it, because their hash is growing so fast. Okay. And I like to see kind of the results before I up the targets, but the hash is going fast and they're lean and mean. So that's where we are there. I don't know, but we want to be, if there is a sign like we're two or three months out from a bear market, that's when I will exit. And everybody in Patreon will know. Um, next is a piece of information as well regarding the miners from Freedom by 40. Shout out to Freedom by 40. Um, I just followed him this morning and he immediately messaged me. So it was really cool. He uh, focuses on Bitcoin miners and Bitcoin. Uh, and his targets, I just thought I'd share because I like to share other people's targets and bring attention to really good creators as well out there in the internet. So 
Thank you for doing your great work, Freedom by 40. First of all, Bitcoin to 80K in six months or less. I think that's an easy get. Uh, he's a target of $45 in six months for CleanSpark. Yep, possible. Uh, 42 definitely. Maybe. <laughs> Depends on Bitcoin, of course. But when Bitcoin does this, you can expect the others to do well too. And then Riot to 40 bucks in six months or less. So again, super interesting. I will be coming out with... An update, I'm working on updates to all the pricing models because this bull market is more bullish than I expected. Therefore, my models need to be upgraded a bit and that will be coming soon because many of you have asked for updates and that impacts the retire on uh, crypto bags and microstrategy bags, etc. Next question. I did tell you it's a big one. We're only <laughs> just over halfway through. You warn about miners going out of business. If Bitcoin does not move above X price by a certain date, or if they operate old efficient rigs. Yes, I do. And if all miners were to disappear or greatly diminish in numbers, the Bitcoin network cannot function efficiently or at all using proof of work. Does this mean that Bitcoin would have to move to proof of stake? And are there any other validation protocols? And what is the probability of this occurring? Great question, Kashi. I like the way you're thinking of that. Let's look at the miners first and where we are. First of all, this, uh, I think I shared this in Okta as well last week. Since 2021, Bitcoin price is the same as it is today, but the difference is the hash rate has tripled, tripled, which makes it hell for the miners. Back in 2021, if they had the same hash, they were getting a lot more reward than they are today. And this reward's about to be cut in half and the hash rate could continue to go up, but we'll talk about what we expect for the hash rate in a minute too. In addition, this is, uh, I have my own separate model on this, but I'd like to share that of other people. This is from CoinShares, and this is their Bitcoin mining cost post having. And you can see CleanSpark is the lowest there with about $28,000. And then it goes up, BitFarms, uh, TerraWolf, Iris, Cypher, BitDeer, Riot, all the way up, and you can read it for yourselves. But basically here, as long as uh the Bitcoin price stays above $52,000. Things like CleanSpark, etc., and other names will be alive and well. The ones further out the spectrum, not so much. So miners, some miners will hit the wall, which means they'll be forced to take some type of action, either issue a ton of shares, issue a ton of debt, sell themselves, go bankrupt, all of the above. I don't know. But some will definitely not make it because of what you said, the age of the rigs, etc. Now, back to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is what I call a self-regulating protocol. So as the hash rises, inefficient miners have to be unplugged because they're not making money anymore. Okay, now that causes the hash to drop. And then <laughs> when the hash drops and if the price is up, for example, if the Bitcoin price rises, it means the miners can then plug in again. And as supply falls, which it will in 52 days, it'll be halved. There'll be a lot less Bitcoin for the things like the ETFs to buy. And that will drive the price up. And then the miners can plug back in, even inefficient ones, depending on the actual Bitcoin price. So from that perspective, the miners aren't going away. They are the real, true money printers. They mint new Bitcoin and Bitcoin is going to go up in value. That's just how it works. But there is some caution, though. First of all, Riot did come out with a warning uh, yesterday, I think. And Riot Platforms warns investors that 2024 Bitcoin halving could pose significant challenges. And there's no guarantee that an increase in Bitcoin's price will be favorable or would compensate for the reduction in mining rewards. Again, some miners have special electricity credits. Some miners make a lot of money on fees. Some miners have very good capital structures, very lean and mean, very modern rigs. Some don't. And full disclosure, I own a little bit of Riot. But my CleanSpark position is at least eight times larger. So that's how I allocate. In addition, my miner model, which does cause some consternation, is designed to... So first of all, there's like 30 or 40 ratios. And on the first column, the average of all final scores is just an average of all the ratios that are fed by financial APIs, okay? The second one on the right is my loaded scores, where I place focus on miners that have low debt, modern rigs, high cash buffer, low SG&A, high EBITDA margins, high production efficiency, some HODL, which is like cash, etc., etc. That's how I weight them. I focus on 
being in positions that aren't going to hit the wall. That's my focus. Now back to your question. Is Bitcoin going to move to proof of stake? No, no chance uh, of moving to proof of stake. Uh, proof of work is the ethos of Bitcoin from Satoshi himself. And we had a huge email dump to get that, that guy pretending to be Satoshi out of the picture. Um, but basically here, Satoshi said exactly as the competition raises the proof of work difficulty, it should become clear that Bitcoin stays scarce. People will see that they can't just get all the Bitcoins they want. It would establish a minimum value under Bitcoins, enabling them to be used for other purposes, if hopefully other purposes are waiting for something to use. And this goes out to how Bitcoin mining works. There is a cost involved. That's why it's the biggest computer system in the world today. So hope that helps. No chance, in my opinion, of moving to proof of stake. And if it did, that would be the end of Bitcoin. Well, let's go. <laughs> now, from Cheesy Invest. The returns with pair trading on steroids are incredible, especially with leverage tokens. Can you give us some advice on how we should test the right settings in our chosen timeframes and place our traps? Use the TV bar replay feature or Selenium or something else. So there's a whole bunch here. Uh, some people may not know what PTOS is. It's one of our models. Uh, pair trading is in my DNA, so it's near and dear to me. But this is PTOS on one of the leverage models on Sol 3x long and 3x short. You basically trade the inverse pair. It has a 90.2% win rate, 805% ROI, 815% ROI over the last year or so. And that's just using a 30-day look back period. So there's lots of things that you can tweak. You can tweak the time frame, you can tweak the look back period, you can tweak the pairs, you can tweak the actual chart, whether it's the one minute, five minute, 15, one hour, four hour, daily, whatever you want. So there's a couple of things here as a backgrounder and people always get confused. It's designed for inverse correlated pairs, all right? Very important to get that. So things like Tesla and Tesla, Sol 3X long, Sol 3X short, Beto, and that should be BT, the second one, not Beto, 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 BT and QQQ and QQQ short. And there's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pairs that we have in our crowdsource document. Now, trading styles, day trading, scalping, swing trading, etc. And also it can be used to single long and shorts using options, which is uh, very important too. That's kind of how I use it. Now, the couple of things you gotta do is be very careful with choosing your assets. Make sure they have that near perfect correlation, all right? Also, consider the volatility and the look back period and the liquidity when playing with these assets. Sometimes I try to play and there's not enough liquidity for me to play. So I've got to find a different pair. So make sure you're aware of that. In addition, make sure you choose and set the time window to a period of time when there weren't crazy things happening, either a massive dumpage or a massive spike. You want to go back to a zone where you have an asset in a range, like a trading range. Uh, so for example, actually, let's go back here to this chart. You can see there's a bit of a spike in the middle of this range, and that was back in late 2023. Uh, so you can pull a, you can set your anchor to after that spike, or you can go out a much longer distance. But always watch the back test too. That's the back test on the right that tells you exactly how these settings perform. And that is your Bible as you go forward. In addition, uh, let's go to a couple of things. Uh, again, be very, very careful. Watch the correlations. Always, as I say, paper trade first, maintain a log of test results to identify the most effective PTOS settings. And remember, they can change because market conditions change as well. Begin with broad timeframes, gradually narrow down, test the look back periods. By the way, sometimes I use this in the five minute or the one minute too. And uh, also watch different market conditions, bull markets, bear markets, all that type of stuff. And using the bar replay, which is a really cool feature on TradingView, um, you can replay historical market scenarios. And instead of kind of actual paper trading yourself, you can use this bar replay to do it. Take out a pen and paper or a spreadsheet, mark all the settings, mark all the results, and then tweak them that way. And experiment with different settings. Again, look back period, time frame, assets, and uh, you can assess exactly how effective it is for you and the assets you want to play. So spend some time on that. Next question is from Brazilian Aussie. Oi, tá bom? Uh, that's my, my little bit of Portuguese there. Uh, I'm 32, 
32 years old, came to Australia from Brazil six and a half years ago, and I had $11 in my account when I started my first job here. Unfortunately, I'm now unemployed, and I'm thinking of learning about trading crypto and stocks to make some money. I have some Bitcoin stocks through a fund and crypto, mostly Solana. If you were me, uh, where and how would you start? Well, it, you, have, you have the drive, you have the time, you're going to need the tools and the discipline. Okay, this... This could become an occupation for you. So treat it like a job. Be very analytical, very disciplined. As I said before, just rewatch the whole session I just covered. Paper trade first. I would start with pair trading, sol 3x long, 3x short, or just sol long and short, whatever you want. Make sure you have access to the right exchange. I don't know what the limitations are in Australia, but I would definitely start with PTOS. And again, paper trade first. That would be the best thing for you. And remember, watch the optimized trend at all times. That'll keep you in the trade and keep you out of the trade too. Also, spend a lot of time in Discourse, which is our dedicated tool support, and you'll find a ton of knowledge there too. All right, next question is from GD, G9D Sprite. Could you please analyze Ronin and Pixels? Uh, they were never mentioned in your layer one charts. Ronin has more the daily users than Solana. I love the network and its development. Um, also, any ideas and feedback about the Blast project and its future airdrop? So, first of all, I don't watch games, game tokens, metaverse. I think they're all money grabs with poor tokenomics. And Ronin has that too. I have no idea what Pixels is, so I didn't even look at that. But regarding Ronin, is it a layer one? I focus on layer ones and layer twos because I believe that's where the opportunity is. And as an investor, I like to focus. I already focus on a lot of stuff. I focus on disruption and equities and miners and Bitcoin, and crypto, layer ones. But for a human to take on more than that is impossible. In addition, Ronin is a sidechain for Axie Infinity. It's a custom-built sidechain that is built off of Ethereum mainnet. It is not a layer one, and therefore I don't look at it. And also, it's not an independent blockchain. It uses a thing called proof-of-authority consensus mechanism. Um, and a, a couple of validators, I think, verify transactions on the game called Axie Infinity, which I don't know anything about other than it's a game. And it's been a money grab so far. But the Ronin chart does look like it's pumped lately, and that's probably what's getting a lot of attention. But uh, again, it's an Ethereum sidechain, not a layer one. And there are tons of them, so I don't look. But I do know that it has done good lately. In terms of the other thing called Blast, I... Don't know anything about Blast, but I did find this, and a shout out to Sanjay as well for sharing. This happened to be in my feed this morning. So Risk on Blast becomes the first rug on Blast, which is a layer two, after it disappeared following a $1 million presale. Again, rug pulls, people stealing your money, L2s, etc. They're all over the place. Be careful out there, everybody. <laughs> Remember, go into crypto knowing that 98% is a scam. And people are there to mug you, all right? Only invest in pristine assets with leadership teams that you can trust. And they're smart and they're experienced, all right? Very important. So, hope that helps. Next question. Security, wallet security from Raz. I have unfortunately clicked on links in my wallets two times, which has me skeptical to click on anything. When you advise having different wallets to stake, do airdrops, is it a different address in an existing wallet or an entirely new wallet? And what's safe? I got a number of airdrops in my Phantom, Phantom wallet, including Sol Chapter 2 pre-order icon, which I've ordered. I know I'm missing out, but would rather not lose it all again and gain percentages. So uh, thank you to the team as well behind this. Our security professionals, they're amazing. Uh, first of all, always use a separate wallet. Okay, the short answer always use separate wallets never mix your staking wallet with your cold storage wallet and the reason is risk mitigation your staking wallets need to be online it needs to be connected to the web3 protocol and you need to constantly use your staking wallets to manage staking pools and your airdrop assets now this means your staking wallets can carry a much higher inherent risk and having multiple wallets and mul and not just multiple addresses in those wallets is one of the most important risk mitigation strategies you can employ. 
and this can compartmentalize your wallets. That way, if one gets hacked, the hackers won't be able to get the rest of your funds. All right. Now, there is some question, and I've heard different things. It hasn't happened to me. But you can open up, say, in Phantom, a sub wallet address, like account one, account two, account three, etc. If account one is hacked, some say the rest can be hacked or drained. Some say they can't. I don't know exactly what the case is because I've heard cases of both happening. So it may, may depend on exactly what piece of draining software is hitting you. We'll talk about those in a second. But remember, use cold storage for your main bags. Remember my 10% rule from earlier and don't click on anything. We'll talk about that in a second too. But remember as well, recently the Ledger Connector Kit hack. This was a Ledger Web3 drainer hack back in December 2023. This was a front-end hack where users connected various Web3 dApps, found uh, that their funds in their wallets was drained. And the breach happened from a malicious drainer code that was embedded in one of Ledger's third-party connector kits. This is exactly why it's so important to have separate wallets every time you connect to Web3, okay? Because if you do that and you own your own wallet, you assume these risks. And by compartmentalizing, you reduce the exposure, etc. And again, I'll mention it one more time. Remember the 10% rule. Never more than 10% in one basket. Print out that 10% slide and stick it on your wall. It's critical. In addition, there is some good news coming. Um, this is from Slorg, which is the Slorg of the slugs. Um, basically, he spoke of wallet draining being a very lucrative industry. And in 2023 alone, I think the impact of drains on wallets is over $300 million stolen from 320,000 victims. Okay, that is crazy. But there is a new feature coming to Solana and Solana wallets. And this is Lighthouse, a smart contract, which is called uh, within your Solana contracts. And it protects you by failing transactions with unexpected changes. This is going to be pretty cool as well. Remember, drains happen on all wallets, MetaMask, etc. It's really difficult, but within Phantom... And I will do a phantom wallet update as to how to use it and how to disconnect certain things running in the scenes. But remember as well, <laughs> free airdrops. <laughs> They're all scams. Do not click on them, hide them. And this is an example of some of the things. And everybody is just, somehow humans are enticed by, oh, look, it's free. Oh, internet's free. Crypto's free. Airdrops are free. It's airdrop season. Click, click, click. Drain, drain, drain. Boom, boom, boom. Don't touch them. It's not worth it. All right, it's just not worth it. Okay, if you want to get clever, you can research what it looks like, spend five minutes on the internet, and it'll tell you it's a scam. Okay, if it's something legitimate like a Jupiter airdrop, and you know you've you've used Jupiter back in 2023, then you know it's legitimate. But again, check before you click, and in fact, don't click, hide. That's uh, what I do. Next question is uh, the final question of the day from Cyber Goose. Historically, what happens when we get an influx of illegal immigrants crossing the border? Asking because currently we're seeing the greatest influx in our lifetimes. So this is a political hot potato question. Hot topic. So I'm going to try just answer it as objectively as I can. I live in the country where this is actually happening. So there is some good news. Um, it can lead to a larger labor force and increased economic growth if they are young and skilled workers coming over the border. That's the good news. But in some in a recent case, I think it was back in December, the US government uh, tried to file a lawsuit against SpaceX to hire over-the-border refugees. But remember, SpaceX also works for NASA, and they have extreme background checks on their employees. So it was a, such a weird lawsuit all I can put it down to is continued harassment of Elon Musk. Anyhow, that's the good news. Well, the first part's the good news. If the people coming over the border are here with good degrees, education, hard workers, lots of skill sets that can make the country a better place, that is good. But the bad news is um, it can lead to lower wages for some workers and increased competition for jobs, particularly menial jobs. 
The biggest problem in places like California and Texas, it can put a and Arizona, it can put a huge strain on local resources such as schools, hospitals, and housing, and it can have a huge potential for additional crime and terrorism, because some of the people coming over the border happen to not come over just to make the U.S. a better place, but to take advantage of it. And then you've got places like California as well, where Gavin Newsom has offered to give free medical and everything to all illegal immigrants. And again, the system already cannot scale for the existing population. How can they do it for all these new people? It's a problem. And uh, some clever people in the world are very aware that it is a problem. So sadly, the bad news outweighs the good news. And best part of the week, uh, from helping animals. This week, we donated to the best friends to help support care, food and shelter for hip and hup cavies. They came from a zoo within a cement enclosure, and now they enjoy food puzzles, sand baths, and plenty of fresh veggies, etc. And these are called cavies, cavies. <laughs> I got that right. Thank you for the team as well, uh, behind the scenes. So uh, let's go. And tomorrow... DCA Live on CTO Larson's channel. And it'll be another fun show uh, as we go forward. 7.30 a.m. Pacific, 10.30 Eastern Time, U.S. and 4.30 Central European Time. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to get smarter. I won't waste your time. And that was the biggest Q&A ever. But it's an important season. This is, again, when life-changing things can happen to you in your station in life. So... Hope you enjoy the show. I'm going to do some live Q&As right now for the team. And again, a huge thank you to the people that work seven days a week behind the scenes. If you think it's just me, ha, <laughs> that would be impossible. Anyway, let's go from Trask. Uh, Trask Bergeson, thank you so much for coming. Um, every week I gain more knowledge. The Patreon is the best ROI I've ever seen. Hey, thank you for coming. Uh, Doc Intern. We're so lucky to be in this bull run. As we take profits, let's make sure we donate a small percentage to some local charity shelter. Good stuff, Doc Intern. Thank you for saying that. We can all make a little difference in our collective communities. Uh, Zen Crypto Deutschland. Fix my portfolio. What it mean? Buying with all dollars? Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that question means. What I mean by fix your portfolio is... Get rid of dead assets, slow-moving assets, assets that aren't part of the narrative or aren't going to return to all-time highs and replace them with things that will really change. Happy feet up there in Canada. Would you buy NVIDIA at its current price? If not, at what price would you go in NFA? Um, I, I don't like things. I like to buy, <laughs> again, I'm like a undervalued disruption investor. It's it's a weird thing. I, I love to buy things cheap and wait. I call it setting my traps, laying my traps. Right now, uh, I still hold NVIDIA and I'm letting it ride because it's always good to have a position in such an asset. But at tops, I sell calls and pull money off the position as well. Um, but I think there are other AI plays that are going to be far bigger than NVIDIA in the future. Far bigger because of what they're doing. And you know the name of that one too. So I continue to literally, um, because all the crypto and miners and everything else have gone up so much, um, currently right now Tesla has fallen to less than a quarter of my portfolio, which means I need to beef it up. And I know it's going to pop one day. And as the crypto market rolls up, I will start pulling from that and buying in the cheapest disruption I can find. And that's just how I work. So I would not buy NVIDIA at this price, but you know what I would buy. <laughs> so still buying things like Solana, you know, if I see uh, like Tesla under 180, I buy. And that's kind of what I do right now. I also hold a little cash just in case there's uh, some buying opportunities around the corner too. Uh, Doc Intern is back because uh, of uncertainty around how miners will do around the halving, thinking of converting them to microstrategy around that time and then maybe revert once the situation is a little clearer later. Thoughts? This is super interesting. Um, that's a, a very good question. <laughs> a very interesting thing to do. I think, I think uh, it depends what miners you're in. You don't, like if you look at the 
the most efficient, the most effective miner out there, hold. If you have something that's on the fence, maybe go to the safe place of MicroStrategy. What you can also do too is play the R between MicroStrategy and Bitcoin. So you could actually, instead of um, say you're rotating out of miner X into MicroStrategy, but per the ARB cloud, MicroStrategy is overvalued. You could buy like FBTC. That way you're still in the Bitcoin trade and then rotate back to MicroStrategy when MicroStrategy gets oversold. Like that thing swings $40 every day. So if you can scalp and if you could do it tax-free, it can be very lucrative too. So Doc Intern, great, great idea. But I think about a three-legged stool on this one. So you got your miner, rotate to depending on either a Bitcoin ETF or MicroStrategy, depending on where they sit. DL, on the finances backed by Panthers and Coinbase, is it worth a small position? I have no idea what Ondo Finance is. Again, it's impossible for one person to track 30,000 cryptos. Um, let me have a quick look. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of these um, companies like Coinbase, they invest in everything. Um, ooh, yeah, that's it's going to face a lot of inflation. Oh, it's an ETH, ETH contract now. Uh, I, I I stay away from ETH contracts. The world has changed right now. If you want to play ETH as a pure play, or the top layer two in ETH do that, but I would not dabble in, in all of the litany of thousands and thousands and thousands of ETH contract plays that are out there, I would not, would not touch. In addition, it is tiny and it faces a lot of bad <laughs> dumpage in the future. Nope, DL, pass. And again, if you're going out on the risk curve and you're going into these sub $100 million crypto caps, make sure they have good tokenomics. All right. There's a new, I just want to take a second here. There's a new tokenomics world out there right now. Look up token 2022. Look up some of these new things where actual owners get really good parts of the rewards of the fees that are made. A lot of give back to the community. It's amazing. When you look at these new tokens and you compare them to the old world, you will never touch the old world again. So DL, check that out. Uh, and by the way, I, I get rewards on like crazy daily rewards and things like Nasana and Fluxbeam and Whales. Uh, it's like pff, blows my mind. By the way, those three are my biggest Sol alt positions as well. Um, I am Colt. If you're swapping old bags for present day Sol alts, which ones should we consider the most? Well, it's it's, it's funny because I am cold. This is a tough one. Uh, part of my philosophy is not to chase, but to replace. And I promised I would uncover 12 soul alts. And literally, I've got this very strict regimen of 10 points. And I have to check all the boxes and all of them, or I will not touch them. I only found seven seven of them and that's what i'm heavily in uh they again their names are nosana flux beam whales market shadow uh what else <laughs> well check my playlist for salts they'd be the ones i look at and they are very volatile they swing huge amounts every single day so watch them together we tried to build a model that would pair trade them but the problem is they're so volatile couldn't couldn't get it to work yet but we're still cracking at that as well uh, so i'm cold hope that helps charles and cannon a possibility of a bitcoin super cycle versus regular four-year cycle this time around absolutely uh give me one second mm. patreon mug i got that for christmas two years ago anyway um super cycle yes we could possibly get one. The ETFs are far beyond my wildest dreams so far, and they will continue to do very well. The marketing machine has not even turned on yet for these ETFs. The Bitcoin and Fidelity are having conferences about Bitcoin <laughs> right now. BlackRock and Fidelity are having conferences about Bitcoin right now. The financial advisors, many of them say, let's give it another 90 days to see if it's going to work out. Of course, after 90 days, we're, you know, 50 days into the halving almost. So the money is yet to come. It's incredible. And there's a lot of state adoption happening behind the scenes. We don't know what it is. 
and I probably know for a fact there are billionaires allocating to Bitcoin right now at this 50k level. We haven't seen the big pumps yet because there's still the nefarious actors being flushed, as I call the turds being flushed for the system. The DCG is the latest one, and who knows, there could be another one after that. We'll see. You know, maybe Binance will need to sell some Bitcoin to pay the $4 billion fine from the US government. I don't know what's going to happen next, but just take these as buying opportunities. All of these turds will be flushed in a limited amount of time, and then it's off to the races, okay? So just be patient. We've got a trap set, and then we wait. Possibility of a super cycle. If ever there was one, this is it, because we have diminishing supply, really hard market, crazy money flows. Bingo. So that's my take. And thank you as well for your super sticker, Andy, Capono, Doodlebug, Brock, uh, I don't know, one just popped in there. Jimmy Neal, Chief360, Iena or Lena, Kiwi Robin, Signal103, and Bitcoin Maxi Mike. Thank you so much. And we also have Crypto Cruiser. Love you, man. Thank you as well for being so active in the community and being there 24 7. Thanks, everybody. Nearly 5,000 watching live. Biggest QA ever and the most watching, too. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jimmy. And have a good night, everybody. I'll see you all tomorrow morning early. Bye-bye.